Hello and welcome to this investigate session on planning and planning models. This is the first session in the module planning and implementation in public health. So in this session, we're going to look at defining and discussing what planning is. What do we mean by planning health promotion and public health projects? And we will then discuss three key planning models. Now remember, the yellow slides are key slides. They're useful for thinking about the assignment that you're going to do, but don't just copy them, analyze them, apply them, synthesize them, and evaluate them. What does that mean? That means you need to read them, think about them, and reflect on them in terms of what they mean to the knowledge that you've already obtained over the last two years. Yeah, it does not mean just copying and just using similar words or changing a few words around it does mean that you have to think about it and spend time thinking about it and that may involve uh, using a dictionary to understand what a particular word means in a definition and also to think about what is being said in that definition and also what is not being said that's really important so what is planning in health promotion and public health and here health promotion and public health is used as essentially the same thing yeah public health is the broader term and health promotion is the, uh, the smaller or aspect of public health that we can do yeah it's not the whole of public health so health promotion is one part of public health and often many projects that we do at local level uh, in local communities, for example, Hounslow or Ealing or Tower Hamlets or a village in Ghana, often are promoting health and well-being. So, the overall purpose of systematic planning in health promotion and public health is to identify goals and the effective means of achieving them. This involves strategic decisions about the most appropriate courses of action, together with operational decisions about deployment of resources and ensuring that all the necessary elements are in place. So let's look at this definition. Yet yeah, the overall purpose of planning in public health is to be systematic, to identify goals. What do you want to achieve? We want to spend money, let's say £100,000 or £50,000 or £1 million on developing a project, uh, implementing it, operating it, running it. Uh, and then hopefully through that project, we are going to affect the lives at the individual level, family level, and obviously the most important level for public health, the community level, uh, in terms of improving community health and well-being so we want to identify goals what do we want to achieve specifically in terms of yes improving public health but what within that might we want to achieve with a project and we want then want to look at the effective means or the most effective ways of achieving that goal or those goals yeah so it could be one goal it could be many goals but let's you know discuss and think about projects with just one simple goal and in the kind of uh, assignments or scenarios that we're going to use uh, in the rest of uh, this module, we are going to think about uh, running three types of projects uh, with a focus on mental health and well-being, diet, healthy diets, healthy eating and physical activity. And these will be aimed at essentially uh, UWL students or we're thinking about how would we run a project for other students in the university? How would we run a mental health and wellbeing project? What would we need to think about in developing the project and then running that project? And then of course, at the end, evaluating that project to see if it's actually made a difference and improved students' mental health and wellbeing. So this systematic planning process, what does it involve? Well, it involves making strategic decisions about the most appropriate courses of action. So what does that mean? Well, in this, in this definition, it essentially means that we do need to make high level decisions. We need to plan forward because a project often runs for at least 12 months. 
uh, and usually for three to five years and sometimes for 10 years or more. So we need to make some strategic decisions about who's going to be involved, how those people, staff members, team members, public health people might be involved, how partners might be involved, how much money we need to allocate and budget for every year for the next three, five, ten years, and what kinds of interventions, appropriate courses of action for us are about what kinds of interventions, what kind of health promotion activities, actions will we do within our health promotion project to provide the most effective way of achieving our goals of improving community health and well-being or some aspect of that like improving increasing levels of physical activity or improving levels of well-being or improving the number of people that are eating a healthy diet and then the second part is we do also have to make operational decisions. So we also have to make local level tactical day to day decisions about how we operate that project, that service, and also about how will we deploy, how will we use the resources that we have. Now resources here means three key things. Um, uh, it means people, skilled people, people with the knowledge, skills, abilities and experience to do the things we want them to do. Public health professionals often, but it could also be partner agencies and their uh, staff. Second, it's about time. You know, we need time. Yeah, we can't do things immediately. Things, health promotion, public health activities take time to improve health and well-being. And three, we often need money in some form or the other. Yes, we can do have skills in kind. We can have partnerships where we're sharing resources in terms of people. But we also need money. And fourth and fifth, which you know feed into the first three, is often things like equipment, buildings, other types of assets that we might need. All of these can be thought about as resources to deliver, to design, deliver, implement, and evaluate the project and lastly what's the last point is ensuring that the necessary elements are in place uh, essentially this is simply saying that we need all the things to come together in the right way at the right time in order to be successful in delivering our project and uh, improving public health and well-being now you this is not a perfect definition. I think this is quite a complicated definition. You may find a better one in some of the other resources and some of the other material we've listed in the reading list. Um, that's by all means fine. But think about this definition as your starting point to think about what planning is in public health. So now let's look at a second definition of planning or creating a plan. Planning or a plan is how to get from your starting point to your end point and what you want to achieve. This is a definition from Naidu and Wills, while the other uh, definition that you saw, the first one was from Green, Tones, Cross and Woodall, and uh, these references are in the reading list. And you can see this definition is much shorter, much simpler, but there isn't a lot of detail yet. Yeah? You just have a starting point, you have an end point, and you try and have something that you want to achieve you get from your start point to your end point it doesn't really tell as much you know it could be for anything it could be a race for example so this is a very simple definition of plan or planning uh, the first one actually has a lot of detail it's more complicated but it's a better kind of once you understand it, it's a better definition of planning so now let's move on to planning models essentially planning is about knowing where we're going. That's the bit in that definition about goals. Where are we going? What do we want to do? What do we want to achieve? And so this is a nice, uh, a bit of a silly kind of joke poster, which is, but is really cool. It says, where are we going? I don't know. I thought you knew. No, I don't know. Maybe he knows. No, he definitely doesn't know. Pause. Maybe no one knows. Pause. Oh, well, I hope it's nice when we get there. So often public health projects can be like this, that often they don't have clear vision, clear aims, clear objectives. And so we can sometimes and often spend money 
that actually leads nowhere. And that's a real waste of money. So it's really important to understand and to plan. So planning helps us to know where we're going, how we're going to get there, what we're going to do to get there, and how will we know when we get there. So planning models, why use them? This is the kind of analysis you're going to need to do, the kind of thinking and reflection you're going to need to do over the coming weeks uh, of this module and what you're going to need to do for both your assignments. Planning is important in helping to design, implement projects so that they're effective and successful. The money and time spent leads to improving people's health and is not a waste of time and money and effort. Yeah? Planning models give a framework, a structure to systematically design and deliver a health promotion project. Planning is a strategic high level skill that senior public health professionals need to have. Planning models help to make the best use of limited resources, whether that's time, money or people, to improve community health and well-being. It also can help to avoid waste and duplication because often there are maybe other projects running in the community. They may be health promotion projects, they may be education projects, they may be leisure projects that are doing the same type of thing that you are intending to do. So often you can piggyback or join in partnership with those existing projects uh, to then enhance the effectiveness both of that existing project as well as your new project. It can also help to prioritise what the most important community health problems are that we want to tackle. So often by thinking about and planning what kind of health promotion program we want to deliver or project we want to deliver or activity we want to deliver, it, it can help us because we're going to do some form of initial needs assessment to work out what the priority issues are in a community and what are the key health issues, key health problems that we need to tackle, deal with. And lastly, it helps to develop the best course of action or the most cost effective source of course of action or the best course of action at that particular point in our that and the best project uh, to carry out again to improve health and well-being. It's important to recognise that there are many, many planning models. Yeah, we are only going to look at three of them, and that there's no perfect model. Yeah, there's no one model that you can use in all situations and all circumstances. There are times when different models help to achieve different goals. Yeah, so different models are useful for different types of projects. So you have to think about what kind of project you want to do and, set, and also what type of planning model will best fit your purpose. All planning models should be flexible, should allow you to adapt them and change them around and work in the way that you want to. They should also be adaptable uh, uh, in terms of different types of people being able to use them yeah not only just knowledgeable people um, and then they should be relatively easy to use yeah so they need to be flexible in terms of how you might use them in the work they need to be able to be adaptable flexible and adaptable similar words yeah I think the uh, the difference between the two is that you don't adaptable means that you don't always have it you can adapt it to the different types of projects that you want to think about. Flexible is that you don't always have to follow the same steps, that you could miss some steps, you could use aspects of the model and that it is still useful to use. And obviously, lastly, easy to use is that it's not difficult and time consuming because if it is difficult, complicated, challenging to use, then you're not likely to use it. So what are the three planning models that we're going to look at? Well, we're going to look at Hubley's planning model, which is the simplest model that we can think of. And then we're going to look at what is called the general planning model or the generalized planning model, which is a bit more detailed. And it's kind of a blueprint for all types of models. All types of models follow something similar to what the general planning model sets out. 
And then we're going to look at what is the most detailed and complex model, the precede proceed planning model. So what can we say about these kinds of planning models? Well, most models start with what we as public health professionals want to do. And in a sense, that's what Hubley's planning model, the simplest one, and the general or generalized planning model uh, uh, focuses on. It's essentially we as health professionals deciding what's best for the community. What's nice about the precede proceed model, though, is that it starts with what the community wants, what they think would improve their health and quality of life. And hence it starts with the outcome. What do communities want? What do we want to achieve uh, 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 in relation to what the communities are saying they want? And then how do we then work backwards to design the project that will lead to that positive health outcome, the positive improvement in health and well-being across our community? As I said, the, and so this fits with the precede proceed model, which is the most detailed model that we're going to look at. So this is quite nice. This is a nice website. It's worth looking at. Um, but this image is quite nice. So here we are, public health professional. We could go in many different directions. We could do many types of projects. So we're going to think of these kinds of questions. Where are we now? What is What are the current community health issues in this community? What are the diseases? What are the health burdens? What are the health risks in that community? That's what where are we now is. Yeah, what are the problems and issues facing that community? And also where are we now is about where are we as a public health professional team? What resources do we have? What abilities, skills, money, time, partnerships do we have that we can use to tackle those problems and issues in local communities? And then second, what are the key causes? What will make the most contribution to changing it? So what are the key causes of these health issues, these risk factors in the local community? And then you have to think about what kinds of projects are then best able to tackle those causes. And lastly, we have to look at our end goal. And that might be the first thing we start with is where do we need to be? Where do we need to go? What change do we hope to contribute to achieving? What's our end goal? What is the purpose of the project? It could also be a program. We could also think about it wider and think about what is our organisation going to do. But I think for now, we're really interested in projects and programmes. You know, what is the purpose of it? We need to think about that. And that's what planning models help us to do. So this is Hubley's planning model. Where are we now? Yeah, where are we now with this community? Where are we now with our skills and abilities? Yeah, where do we want to go? What do we want to achieve? Where's the far mountain that we're trying to climb? How will we get there? What kind of health project shall we do? And then lastly, how will we know when we get there? Yes, because if we don't... Excuse me. If we don't think about evaluating, think about how we will know when we've achieved the goals we've set for our project, then how will we know whether we need to change it? Because if we find that we don't want to wait three years before we find out that the project isn't working, we need to know in year one, we need to know six months uh, from starting the project that we need to change it, we need to improve it, we need to do things differently. Yeah, so we need to have some kind of end goal, some indicators at the end, some milestones, some something that we can measure, whether that's talking to communities or whether that's improvements in health that are linked to routine health indicators and health profiles. So in community health profiles, we see an improvement in, you know, for example, uh, teenage pregnancy rates or improvements in GCSE results or reductions in crime or improvements in physical activity or reductions in cardiovascular disease uh, and deaths from cardiovascular disease. So what are the strengths and weaknesses of Hubley's planning model? And again, this is about analysis. So uh, again, think about it. Don't just uh, write these things in your assignment, but think about them. Why am, are we saying this? Why am I saying this? This model is really nice and simple. I hope you'll agree. It's nice, four steps. It's easy. It's written in a nice, easy, clear way. But what's the problems with it? So it is nice. It's a nice way to start off, especially for uh, um, less experienced people. But it doesn't really help people new to planning to actually get the details right. How can we? How can someone who's very new, like yourself, students, new to it, it doesn't really tell you what you need to do. It doesn't tell you how to choose the project. It doesn't tell you how to 
find out about the community health issues that you need to think about it's just these four questions so basically people new and experienced public health people need to a more detailed model to be help to help them to plan uh, a successful health promotion project now i've just realized here and hope you can spot that point two and point three are actually the same point yeah um so they're not different points so think about that when you come back to this that actually they're the same point so now we come to the second planning model the general planning model yeah and as i said before all planning models are similar to this they follow similar steps to this yeah and so what's step one so the step one is understanding your community doing a needs assessment and if you remember you did a bit of that in promoting mental health and well-being you did that in assessing population health and you did that in delivering health promotion interventions and now you're going to you're doing this or thinking about this in this module you set goals aims and objectives yeah often a single goal and a single aim and then a number of objectives that will hope to meet that goal or aim again you did that in delivering health promotion interventions and you also had a goal an aim and objectives in educating for health thirdly you want to identify the methods and approaches you want how, that will help to achieve your aim you know what kind of health interventions what actions can we take is it going to be motivational interviewing is it counseling is it some kind of uh, a health project that's delivered in a community center is it a health project that gets people running and you're creating a running or walking club is it about getting kids to school having a, a, a walking bus school bus to get so kids can walk to school uh, in a safe and uh, uh, group and coordinated way so you want to think about what those methods what those approaches what those interventions could be and again you you did a, a bit of that in delivering health promotion interventions and educating for health for you want to identify resources again time people money equipment buildings access uh, to uh, facilities you know or being close to uh, delivering it close to communities what kind of resources do we have partnerships what kinds of things do we have that will help us to deliver that project in a uh, useful uh, timely uh, low cost and uh, you know successful way so that improves health and well-being five is about planning and designing evaluation into your project so it's what kinds of evaluation methods will you use and so you did that in promoting mental health and well-being a little bit you did a little bit of that in research methods in terms of thinking about how you evaluate critically appraised studies and what what goes into research studies and then you also did a little bit in delivering health promotion interventions and educating for health and then the last two points is you develop an action plan and the implementation plan how are you going to action this project that you've designed yeah how are you going to deliver it and then last after you've developed your action plan you're going to action that action plan you're going to do the things that you've written in your action plan in your implementation plan so you're going to implement and action the project you're going to run it you're going to deliver it and then over time you're going to evaluate it and monitor it and make sure that it's going to be a successful project so you can see these seven steps are similar to most other models and you can probably fit many of these steps if not all of them uh, to the next model the precede and proceed model but before we do that let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the general planning model so in this this model is more detailed has clear and easy to understand steps yes it's very clear it's much clearer than the first one yeah it tells you what the seven steps are it tells you what kinds of things you need to think about i've just explained them to you but one of the weaknesses of this model so that's good but one of the weaknesses of that of this model is that it's not really participatory there's no kind of engagement with communities it doesn't say you know talk to communities and find out what they're interested in what they want find out what they think about your project or your design of your project will it work in their community so yeah so that's a weakness yeah because it's really good to ask communities because the more engagement you get from communities the more likely communities are going to get involved and be part of your project and you know um, 
be six so that your project is successful because if communities get involved if communities come to your project come to your service they attend your edu health education sessions they do the activities they they are part of the walking club then you, your project will be successful but if they don't think if communities don't think what your project is relevant to them is useful to them you know they don't think you know, why are you doing it uh, they're not engaged they they don't feel this is the right kind of project that you should be running then you know the project is much less likely to be successful and probably will be unsuccessful there's a little bit more information for new public health professionals uh yeah so so yes uh, but it's not enough even with this you know i've explained it to you there's still not enough detail here specifically again how are you going to do that needs assessment uh, what kinds of resources can we think about yeah it's not it, so there's detail but it's still not enough yeah and lastly it's not really specifically focused on public health i mean this model could be used for any kind of planning for any kind of project uh, an it project uh, a building project you could use this for any general type of project or service that you might want to deliver so it's not health uh, it's not public health focused uh, in any way uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing but it would be better and more useful if there is a public health focus to the model so now we come to the what is the most complicated model of the three models and i'm going to go through this in a bit more detail and we will look at this again uh, next week as well so this model starts with phase one here it is phase one social assessment and in that social assessment you're thinking about things about quality of life so this first assessment is going is about essentially community engagement community consultation so at this stage the first stage the more first thing you do you don't worry about what kind of project you yeah you're not doing a needs assessment as we normally know it as we did in assessing population health where we looked at health profiles you we went onto the public health website and we looked at disease burdens and we looked at rates of uh, heart disease and rates of cancers and hospital admissions for alcohol abuse and uh, rates of smoking in teenagers so we looked at all those kinds of things that's not what we start with we start with a social assessment we talk to communities and say what do you think are the key problems in your community key health problems key social problems what is likely to improve your quality of life yeah not just health but your overall quality of life yeah which is a much broader concept than just improving your health and well-being so you start with that you go and talk to communities you do focus groups group interviews you might even do questionnaires yeah so you're going to talk to a range of different people as many as you can you might have a uh, community meetings in in uh, you know church halls in community centers day centers you might talk to young people older people people in work uh, families uh, women with uh, young children ethnic minority groups you're going to talk to a range of different people it depends on what kind of project but this would be a wide range of project you might talk to all of these groups if it's a, if you're thinking about uh, targeting one specific group of people for example an ethnic minority community let's say afro-caribbean community or a, a southeast asian community or poor white working class community on an estate you, you could focus there or you could focus on the whole community you know the whole community of hounslow the whole community of ealing so that's the first phase and then what's the second phase so the second phase has is the epidemiological assessment phase and this is the phase you know about this is the kind of public health assessments that we do and so within that we look at things like what is the existing health issues in that community we can also do an observational assessment of the local environment we may have information on things like air pollution and noise that also feed into this epidemiological assessment what kind of environment you know what do people have access to high quality foods do they have access to green spaces and high quality parks or do they live in safe neighborhoods that they feel you know okay to go out and walk and talk with people to let their kids play out yeah or is it a bit do they have busy streets are they worried about crime uh, and so you know their kids stay at home yeah so that's the environment bit and then the behavior bit is about doing an assessment now you may have data or you might have to go out and find that data and again talk to communities about it. 
What kinds of health behaviors are, do people currently have? What kind of health risk, uh, risky behaviors, less healthy behaviors are they engaging in? So that we can then think about what kind of project we might make. And we may also look at genetics. Now, genetics, we, we you know, in most health promotion projects, we won't look at it a lot. But it may be, for example, in some communities, you know, that certain types of illnesses happen more often. So we talk about Afro-Caribbean communities. Uh, if you remember determinants of health, we said Afro-Caribbean communities more likely to have sickle cell anemia, uh, Mediterranean communities and uh, kind of Arab Middle Eastern communities more likely to have uh, 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 thalassemia and uh, North European communities more likely to have uh, cystic fibrosis. And these are all genetic diseases, genetic disorders. So, you know, for some communities that might be an important thing. But generally for most cases, the epidemiological assessment is in these three parts. What are the current health issues? What the health data is telling us? Or what can we tell about the environment, both from existing data, from other sources, you know, routine sources that's collected every day, day in, day out, like air pollution information? Or maybe we can walk around the communities like we did in assessing population health and have a walk around these communities and see what's good and what's not so good in there in these communities local environment and then we can also look at people's behaviors but obviously it's easier to talk to them and find out and maybe there is some information about uh, local health behaviors that we can uh, 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 use to think about and do an assessment and so taking account of the social assessment and then we do an epidemiological assessment and then we do a third assessment and there's also a fourth assessment and the third assessment is what's called the educational and ecological assessment and this looks at three key things predisposing factors enabling factors and reinforcing factors so the predisposing factors are the things that people are doing you know that they're predisposed to that they're already falling into like that so it might be an area that has high levels of smoking it might be an area that has high levels of uh, drinking it might be an area that has low levels of physical activity so the predisposing is what are people already currently doing what are they predisposed to doing what are the current health risks that they're suffering from that they're experiencing enabling is the opposite it's about what's in the environment uh, that will enable people to do positive behaviors yeah so maybe there is a wonderful local park so there's low physical activity but actually the park's really good and maybe if we can get people into that park uh, we can you know improve their physical health and well-being so we can use that enabling factor like the existing park that we have enabling factors may be people in the community like families are really keen and interested they want to change their and improve their diets and, and learn how to cook and uh, you know and uh, um, uh, change their current dietary uh, behaviors and what they're currently eating and what they're currently cooking so that could be another enabling environment you know where you've got supportive family and friends to do that yeah it could also be that we have other partners and agencies that can help us to create that positive environment and then reinforcing factors are factors that may reinforce the negative predisposing risky factors or they can reinforce the positive enabling factors that will lead to healthy behaviors yeah and one example if we talk about it from individuals is if they are you have two individuals you know husband and wife or a partner um, um, and if both partners smoke then one and if one decides to stop smoking or quit smoking while the other one continues then it's more difficult than if both partners decide to quit uh, or if either partner that it doesn't want to quit is supportive of his or her partner quitting smoking yeah but often what happens is the person who doesn't want to quit we kind of put pressure on the person who does want to quit or create an environment where that person finds it more difficult to quit yeah um, so again the same thing so if you're living in an environment that's unsafe that could be a predisposing factor you feel there's high crime you may not be high, if there's litter in the park if there's used condoms if there's uh, 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 used needles you know uh, uh, syringes in the park then you uh, burnt cars in the park uh, you know uh, graffiti uh, uh, so all these things may make it risky for people to go out and go to the local park yeah so that is stopping people 
stopping people, parents uh, uh, and children from potentially using that park. So that, that also counts because remember it's an ecological say it's a very broad based assessment but predisposing factors could also link to behaviours and this is where the arrows come in and this is where the complexity comes in. So you can see all these arrows so predisposing factors link to reinforcing factors, they, they affect each other, similarly reinforcing and enabling factors uh, affect each other and all these three things affect people's behaviours. Yeah? So the predisposing in fact our attitudes maybe maybe you can have an attitude to say you know diet it's not a big deal you know it doesn't matter if you eat chips and uh, uh, burgers every day you know i like it you know what's the problem yeah i don't think it's unhealthy so these predisposing attitudes behaviors um, uh, understandings of health as well as the wider environmental factors are all kinds of predisposing factors so they can be predisposing factors in the individual yeah they're they're perceptions their attitudes their beliefs about health can impact on their behaviors but it also could be their family here yeah, around them that maybe they're fa they're trying to be positive but they're uh, and trying to have healthy behaviors but their family around them have the negative behaviors and so that kind of pushes them uh, away from that and that would be a reinforcing factor that reinforces the negative behaviors and then the third thing is looking at the wider environment. So you've got the individual level and then the wider environment that has an impact. Yeah. So you can see this quite a complex model. Uh, so the wider environment, if the wider environment is not supportive, like as the Ottawa Charter says, that, you know, supportive environments create the opportunity for people to change their behaviours. Yeah. OK. And so similarly, enabling, often enabling is about enabling environments. You know, I've also, I think there should be a line from predisposing factors to here. I think here they're really thinking about the individual, but I think you can have predisposing negative factors on the environment. So I think you can have an arrow, it's not here, but it, it can be there uh, to create negativities there. Yes. Um, and then, of course, you can see here the behaviours that people have impact on people's health and their quality of life the environment people live in impacts on their health and then impacts on their quality of life and health of course feeds into quality of life so that's how this model works it's not that difficult it's here where all the action is taking place in phase three and phase four yeah so let's move on to phase four and we'll come back to this thing uh, uh, next time in the next video and we can also talk about it in the apply session <laughs> So phase four is the administrative and policy assessment and intervention alignment. So what the what is this? What is this? So in this area, what we're looking at is are we linking into existing local policies? Are we linking into national policies? Or is our project and the thing we're thinking about doing actually different from what what you know what governments want us to do from national government and local government and and through that communities indirectly because obviously policies are made in relation to what's already happening in local communities and often with community input so we need to align our project our health promotion activities with existing policies existing regulations but we also need to link in what kind of organizational aspects do we have do we have buying from councillors do we have buy-in from senior management in the local authority? Yeah, because if we don't have buy-in from people in the organisation we're working is because public health sits with local authorities. If in the local council people don't like your project, don't like what you where you're going with that project, or I'm working with that community, then you're not going to be successful. So you need to align with existing policies. What the what we're expecting to do over the next five years, you know, our um, uh, uh, health and well-being strategy for the local council. Do we? do do we link into that do we link into that or not so as i said we need to link into this aspect of what kind of organization what kind of organizational aspects do we need to consider and also this also links into people time and resources you know our organization will provide the resources for us to deliver our project and then lastly what kind of health promotion strategies it talks about just educational strategies but i think you need to think broader what kind of health promotion public health activities can we do at, you know in all sorts of uh, uh, different ways from you know we might go on radio and tv and it is purely educational but we might do things like motivational interviewing and one-to-one -one counseling activities we may also do cooking skills sessions you know so that education doesn't just mean talking to people or giving them a leaflet or telling them about you know what is a good diet and what's an unhealthy diet it's also about helping them supporting them motivating them and giving them the power and the skills and the abilities and the confidence 
to change their behaviors and so these strategies these health promotion strategies that we think about can act at three different levels they can act on the negative predisposing factors that are leading to unhealthy behaviors both in the individual uh, and in the wider community in terms of reinforcing factors as well as in the wider environment you know not having a good safe neighborhood uh, not having easy access to food because you've only got one local shop in the area and the local supermarket is miles away and takes three buses to get there yeah or it could focus on the reinforcing factors you know focusing on the family focusing on how to change these wider reinforcing factors that are making people go yeah so maybe you could open a shop maybe you could have once a week you can have this farmer's market come there maybe you could have a van with fresh fruit and vegetables coming in there so you're changing those reinforcing factors yeah you could also call that this uh, the the fact of uh, creating this van to take things out as an enabling thing as well because you're changing the environment you're creating an opportunity for a, a shop on wheels to go around and for people to access fresh fruit and vegetables more easily at an affordable price yeah so some of these things like reinforcing and enabling i think this is where the challenge is between predisposing reinforcing and enabling so predisposing is the negative factors in the in individual in the community and in the wider environment physical and social that are causing those unhealthy behaviors enabling factors are the positive factors both at the individual community and wider environment physical and uh, social uh, environments that lead to positive and healthy behaviors and reinforcing factors can be both reinforcing factors can be factors that reinforce the negatives and the negative behaviors or they can reinforce the pot potential positive behaviors yeah and for each kind of project they're different things yeah and it depends on that community and so one of the things to do is if you look at, at some of the reading lists we do have some papers and you can find more there's many many more papers out there where they've used the precede posted model and those papers will give you a more clearer and and more specific uh, uh, examples on how these predisposing reinforcing and enabling factors work yeah okay and then phase five is implementation yeah so this is about how we activate action the project how we make it run and hopefully deliver our uh, project and the activities within that project to improve health and well-being in the community and then the last three phases six seven and eight are about evaluation so there's something called process evaluation there's impact evaluation and there's outcome evaluation so process evaluation is the process how does our project run you know how does our service run yeah what kind of you know are we friendly and welcoming when people come in uh, uh, is our uh, project accessible you know is it is it nice and in the heart of the community that we want to work with or is it far away and actually people have to do a lot to get to that project before they can access it yeah is it done in a culturally appropriate way is it done in a way that you know uh, respects local communities so process evaluation is about does the project work correctly in the way we hoped and in the way that the communities want it to run yeah so in this context it doesn't matter about whether you've improved health have you done the right things does the service run in a way that's nice and positive and good for communities yeah and then impact evaluation is the short-term impacts yeah what are the immediate impacts how many people have come to that service you know how many people uh, say that they've valued and and uh, enjoyed using that service and felt that they've benefited from it yeah and then out so again this may not be about changing their health this is just about saying that they found it a positive experience yeah uh, because you may not see a change in health in the short term and then outcome evaluation is long term six months 12 months later after they've been part of the project has it improved health have the indicators you know the health profile indicators at local community level have they changed has people work mental health and well-being changed if we write, gave them a questionnaire and we might send them a questionnaire uh, uh, about their mental health and well-being or quality of life will they change will they say yes my quality of life has improved and i think it's because of that project that my quality of life has improved yeah so you could do three types of different types of evaluation and each of these types of evaluation are really important yeah and the last thing as you can see and you can see the these this orange line running across it yeah so precede you do precede is about doing these assessment tasks yeah working out what kind of project we want and then you go down and then you come to the proceed task and i'll explain what precede and proceed stand for in a minute and it's essentially about 
monitoring and evaluation is about quality. It's about enhancing and improving the quality of a service and having this notion of continuous quality improvement because we can always get better. A service can always get better. My teaching can always be better. Yeah, uh, I can, every day, every week, every month, I can get better as a professional, you know, whether I'm a public health professional, whether I'm a footballer. Yeah, so that's what co quality improvement or continuous quality improvement is about. Is any field of work or activity we can get better. If we play the piano, we can get better. If we're um, uh, good at uh, taking photographs, we can get better. Yeah, and so we need to build in a process through monitoring and evaluation where we're improving constantly regularly improving the quality of our service so we're doing better than we did yesterday and the day before uh, and a month ago and a year ago so what is precede and proceed about so you said the steps so here i'm kind of going through it with in a bit more detail yeah and i'm just going to run through it because i've kind of already explained it so social assessment is a, a type of needs assessment it's it doing interviews focus groups questionnaires surveys with people who are the target for the project yeah it might be the whole community or it might be some specific group within that community it's the people we hope will benefit from the project yeah so in our example that we're going to use across the module it's uwl students who we hope will benefit from a mental health and well-being project yeah and as i said above we can use interviews focus groups and questionnaire surveys uh, with people yeah so i'm just repeating that so I'm going to probably cut that out. And the second thing is epidemiological assessment. And that is a type of needs assessment that's focused on health problems in the target group. Yeah, again, it's UWL students, for example. That, that's the example we're going to use, but it could be any group. Yeah, yeah. this is about the health problems, the risky behaviours, their social and physical environment. As I said, genetics is not the most important. So this is like using routine information. It's surveys of university students, surveys undertaken by UWL. It's also existing data. Yeah, if it's about local communities, it's existing data about health profiles. Yeah, it's like having the Hounslow health profile, the long and short profiles that you did in assessing population health. Uh, that, that are the key things that you can look at yeah and if you remember it's that fingertips website and for those if there are uh, what you want to go back and look at it type in fingertips PHE and you come on to that and you can have a look at some of the information that's regularly collected thirdly is the educational and ecological assessment and in this area, as we said, talked about before, it's, we're talking about predisposing factors, enabling factors, and reinforcing factors. So predisposing factors are individual level mostly, but they could be wider factors, but if we can focus on individuals, that's totally fine. Individual factors that lead to risky behaviors, poverty, lack of education, shops not selling fruit and veg, people's beliefs and attitudes about health and disease, yeah, and about improving their health and well-being yeah and also whether they think they've got the power of, uh, to change whether they've got the confidence whether they have the self-belief to say i can change my circumstances enabling factors are the individual and wider environmental factors that will support the intervention and help people change their behaviors yeah and then the reinforcing factors are the wider family and community factors uh, uh, that might make it easier or more difficult for people to adopt those healthy behaviours. So reinforcing factors work on both predisposing factors and enabling factors. So what's for policy and administrative assessment? Is the project intervention allied, fits with existing national and local policies and regulations? Are political, organisational and administrative structures able to design, deliver and evaluate the project? Maybe you don't have the resources, maybe you don't have the structures and systems in place for you to be able to deliver that project. What existing programme services and projects are running and how do they link into this existing project? Are you duplicating things? Can you work in partnership with ones that are similar to what you want to do? Could political, organisational or administrative aspects make it difficult to design, deliver and evaluate the project? Yeah. What resources are there? Skilled people, time, money, partnerships, equipment, building, social and news media and other things that can help you deliver that project more successfully. Five is implementation. How will the project be delivered to that specific target group of people? When, where, how will it work? How will it operate? What resources will you have? 
and so on. You know, the details of how you're going to do it precisely. Is it going to be a 24 7 service? Is it going to be a 9 to 5 service five days a week? How is that going to work? Is it an evening service? Yeah. As I've said, six, seven, eight is about evaluation. So here it is, you know, process evaluation was the process of designing, delivering the project done in a good way. Did it involve the target group? Did it involve key professionals? Was it open and honest? Is the project delivered in a kind, sympathetic and positive way? Impact evaluation is what are the short term benefits of the project? Did a lot of people use the project? Did people like using the project? Did other partner organizations like the project and what it is doing? and was there an immediate improvement in health? It's often unlikely that you'll get an immediate improvement, but people will often say, yeah, that they found it interesting, worthwhile coming to use the project and, and to access the services that, that you're providing them through that project. Outcome evaluation or what the long term benefits, you know, did people's health improve in a significant way because of the project? Or maybe something else did it, yeah? So that's where it's difficult to, to assign it. You know, is it your project that did the positive or is it some other thing in the wider environment that had that impact? So that's why monitoring and evaluation is really important so we can see if there is improvement a, 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 a year from now or two years from now or longer, yeah? So what are the strengths and weaknesses of the precede proceed planning model? This model is a very detailed model and it tells us clearly what steps to take and to do to develop a project and the connections between uh, the different elements in the planning process in the structure of the model you can see how one thing affects another uh, with those nice arrows so you can really get a detailed understanding it's very comprehensive it covers all the key things really that we need to think about when designing a project it is specifically developed for public health and health promotion interventions yeah What's the downside? It is really a complex model. Some of the steps, you know, predisposing, uh, enabling, reinforcing are quite difficult to understand. And that administrative assessment is also, you know, what goes into that. Some aspects are not only difficult to understand, but a bit vague, you know. So, so and, and lastly, some of the steps may be quite difficult to do. You know, some groups may not be that keen to have a chat, yeah. So sometimes you may not have all the information that you'd like to have that each of the steps wants you to take. It's quite a long uh, process of uh, designing uh, a project through using precede proceed you know it will probably take you at least six to twelve months to deliver yeah it's not a quick and you know you within a, a month or so you've designed and uh, developed the project so you can then run it you know in months two it does take time so some of the steps could be quite difficult you know engaging communities for one working out all these steps what are the predisposing factors what are the enabling factors what are the reinforcing factors aren't always easy to spot yeah because you have to go and you may have to talk to that target group of people that you might have to go and talk to the wider community if you're targeting everyone in a community to talk about what these things are and try and map these things out and get a sense of what the key negative and positive factors are what's good about it it starts with what communities want the desired outcome uh, is about what communities think will improve their health and their quality of life it's a hence it's a participatory model it explicitly includes communities in the design and planning of public health interventions that's an important positive it takes account of national and local policies existing services and projects and makes sure or tries to make sure it links into them yeah works in line not against them it also looks at resources, skilled people, time, money, equipment, buildings, partnerships that, you know, what do we have as public health professionals and our team of public health people uh, and the organisation we work for? What can we utilise to make the best use of the things that we have to deliver that project and make it a success? And also it's, it does briefly talk about channels of communication to, to, to target groups in terms of talking about educational strategies. So, you know, do we use social media? Do we use local newspapers? Do we use local TV and radio? It is quite a holistic model and it uses what's called an ecological model or ecological approach to health and we'll come on to what that is in a moment to developing health promotion and public health intervention. It looks at all the determinants of health acting at different levels. Yeah, individual, that's what ecological means. It works, at, it un, tries to understand all the different uh, levels at which the determinants of health act. The individual level, the family level, 
the community neighborhood level and the population level and it tries to act at all these levels or at least think about all these levels and think about how all these levels might affect your project yeah because maybe you're doing well at the individual level but things are happening at the community level that may may, may cause problems for your project and if you can think about them uh, early at the design stage you might be able to reduce their impact or overcome those negative barriers in the community and actually improve the possibility of a project so one of a pro uh, uh, one example of a project if we, we can think of that is a, a hiv kind of stigma project you know or hiv awareness project so you can go into a local community and talk about hiv but sometimes there's a lot of stigma around people who have hiv so if you do a project where you're trying to target people with hiv maybe get them to to go and get tested more regularly then you do need communities to be on side because potentially communities could have negative views about people with HIV and that could stop people and prevent people with HIV from going for testing and going to clinics and getting treatment because they're worried of what people will say in their community yeah so this is what we mean by predisposing factors or reinforcing factors that you know people might be predisposed to say you know I'm not sure I want to go for HIV test I don't want to know anything about it but it might be made worse by the fact that the community are not open don't like to know who's got HIV and if they do find out that you know they're stigmatized ostracized you know people are not talked about or talked to by communities because they're seen as you know like people with this disease yeah so if we actually target our project targets the community tries to raise awareness in the community first tries to get a positive view change attitudes in the community first then our project with people with hiv would be more, more likely to be effective yeah so sometimes in order to target one group of people you might have to target uh, people around that group to make sure your project then works you try and act at many different levels so as I said, we're going to talk about ecological model in the next session in, 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 in that we're going to do the next investigation session. Um, so what's the whole point uh, of this module? Well, the whole point of this module is in the kind of investigate scenario that we've given. You are part of a team that has been asked to develop a report to design, deliver and evaluate a combined mental health, diet, physical activity and sexual behaviour project for year one students across the University of London. So if you think about this and keep this in mind and then think about how you might design and deliver and write that report, even a 10 page report, that will stand you in good stead to understanding how to do the assignment and how, uh, in terms of the both the group digital story as well as the short essay that you have to do. But this is the key thing. This is the key learning. How can you develop the skills at a high level and an introductory and a kind of trainee level at this undergraduate level to design, deliver and evaluate uh, health promotion project yeah. uh, so reflecting back on each of the modules you've covered in the last few years think about and that's part of the investigate what ideas and concepts theories and approaches could you use to link into this discussion here yeah you're not going to use all of those here because that would be too much but this module does link into almost every other module you've done yeah okay Thank you. I hope you found this helpful and useful and I look forward to talking with you soon. Just to leave you with some last points, planning and implementation is a difficult and complicated process. It requires a lot of thinking. There isn't any shortcuts to thinking deeply about it and having good information about the community you want to target yeah you need to engage with lots of different people from lots of different organizations and also lots of different people in local communities as well lots of different stakeholders yeah there's no single best approach to planning implementing and evaluating health promotion projects yeah when you design deliver uh, and evaluate health promotion project there's no one fantastic model that's going to do everything the pre-seed proteus seed model is very good uh, but you know it is a difficult model to use there's no one best approach and that pre-seed proceed model may not work in every situation uh, every type of uh, uh, community uh, and project that you're interested in doing well, I hope you enjoyed this session. Uh, think about what one thing you might take away from this uh, video lecture and what one thing did you not understand or find confusing. And remember that, put that on the peer support forum or bring that to the apply session that we're going to do. and We can uh, discuss it in more detail.